All right, so between these two blocks here, block A and block B, we have what we call a contact force. So how I'm going to draw that over here is block B is actually applying a force upward on block A. If it didn't, block A would just fall all the way to the ground, right? So we have a block, a force here. I want you to label this as uh, uppercase F, force of block B on A. Label it like that, okay? It's not a normal force because the problem is I want normal forces only to come from walls or floors or something that is a large fixed surface. I don't want it coming from two blocks connecting each other because then you have normal forces and you have a different normal force here and here and you get confused because you have too many normal forces. So I want you to write it like this. Now block A also has a tension force. So there's a tension force right here. Going to the wall. Notice I made those the same length because the box is not moving up or down. There's a tension force to the wall, but what's the force over here that's making it try to move? Okay, so there's a force here. But what is that force? Well, to figure that out, let's go to block B first. So block B here is actually, I didn't draw you, but the Block B is bigger than A, it has a bigger mass. So that means my gravity has to be bigger because the mass of B is bigger than G. I mean, mass of B times G is bigger than mass of A times G. The force of gravity on this one is bigger than this because it has more mass. Okay? Then we have a normal force from the ground. Okay? So we have a normal force going up here, and it's actually going to be very large. It's going to be larger than this one. Why? Because if there's a force of B on A, there has to be an equal and opposite force of A on B. And that goes right here. These are what we call a Newton's law, third law pair. And I'm getting kind of ahead of it because we don't really get to that until chapter 7. But just start thinking of that. If you have two forces touching, two objects touching, the force of one on the other has to equal the force of the other on the one. Meaning, force of B on A has to equal force of A on B, opposite directions. Notice also, I don't want you to draw your forces right on top of each other because it gets very confusing if you have four or five forces and some people try to draw them on top with different arrows. You get confused. Just draw it off to the side. We know that they're both going in the downward direction. All right, and then we have a tension force over here, but this is a different tension force. So I'm going to call this tension 2 because this is going to be tension 1 up here. This is going to be tension 2. So I've got to make sure I label these. We can't just call it T because there's more than one tension. All right. Then we have friction here. There's friction between the floor and the block B. And the box is moving this way, so friction has to be going this way. So we have a friction force. Remember, friction is lowercase. But I'm going to do lowercase k because it's kinetic friction, it's moving. But it's from the ground, so I'm going to call it force of kinetic friction from G, from the ground, or the floor. But there's more friction than that. Notice there's also friction up here between these two blocks. As this slides out, it feels friction on the bottom and friction on the top. And that's still opposing its motion, so there is another friction going this way. This is the friction of block A on block B. So it's kinetic friction of A on B. And I have to make sure my tension's far enough, because this is constant velocity, to add those two together, it has to match this length right here. Same thing here. Those two add together have to add to make the normal force. But you see this, if I have a frictional force of A on B, I have to also have a frictional force of B on A. That's what this force is right here. This is the kinetic frictional force of B on A. So as this frictional force here is opposing B pulling out, it's also making A try to move. It's the tension that's keeping it from moving. Imagine if there was no tension, if we disconnected the string, they would just move together. And it's the static friction then that would hold it in place. But since B is sliding out, both of these are kinetic friction. There you go. Now that's your free body diagram. That's what it should look like. 
All right, step two would be to put it on any of them, take components of them that are on an axis. But in this case, they're all on the axis. Every single force we put on here is on an axis. Now where it gets complicated is you'd have to do F net X for, and F net Y for block A, and F net X, and F net Y for block B. So you start to get like three or four equations simultaneously and you have to solve them. Some of these problems get very, very long. But that's okay. You just got to do it a step at a time and you'll be okay. Chapter 5, we're doing free body diagrams. We're good with that free body diagram. Okay? All right. I'm going to do one more case of a free body diagram. Let's say I have a block on an inclined plane again. But I'm going to apply a force on the block at an angle like this. And the block is going to accelerate up the incline. Okay? I want a free body diagram for that block. So, again, I'm going to draw my point here. Gravity is going to be down, the mass of the block times g. Okay. And this is just an applied force here, my hand pushing on it. So I'm just going to call that F. So I have a force of F going like this. Okay. But it's accelerating up the incline, so I have to have friction, but friction has to be going the, down the incline. So I got a friction force going this way. And it's kinetic friction. Since there's only one block, I don't have to put any more subscripts. Kinetic friction going this way. And then I also have a normal force going this way. All right. So what do I do with an inclined plane problem or any problem? I have to figure out which way the block or the object is moving. And I make that one of my axes. In this case, I'm going to make it the x-axis. So I'm going to make my x-axis like this. Rotate my x-axis so it's like this. This is going to be the y direction. And so for step two, I have to take any block that's not on the uh, one of the axes, any force that's not on the axis, I've got to take the components of it. Remember, we're on an inclined plane, so this angle theta is equal to this angle theta right here. So I have here mg, uh, sorry, cosine of theta is going in this direction. And then this way, I have mg sine of theta. I just realized I've got to make this force a lot bigger. All right, so this force is going to be something like that. I'll show you why in a second. Now, gravity has been split into two components that if you add them together would get you this. But we have them on the y and x-axis. But the force also has to be placed on the x and y-axis. We have to take components of it. Now notice that this angle here is equal to this angle here. And so when I do this, remember I drop a perpendicular to the line. So this is my x component. I draw a perpendicular over here. This is my y component. So I'm going to redraw this so it's not quite as confusing. So the red arrow here is the gravity component. This is mg cosine theta. And then I have here, this is f cosine theta going in this direction. And then down here I have f sine of theta. So notice, now, for this to accelerate, F cosine theta has to be bigger than both of these added together. Gravity is trying to pull it down the incline, and friction is trying to pull it down the incline, or keep it from going up the incline. So this distance here has to be bigger than those two added together. That's why I had to extend my force. And notice the normal force is much, much bigger than the gravity because as I'm pushing into it, I'm increasing the normal force. I have a component of my force 
that's increasing the force of the normal force. It's kind of like when I push on a wall. If I push with like one pound, the wall pushes back with one pound. If I push with five pounds, it's going to push back with exactly five pounds. So it's going to push back with whatever I apply to it. If it didn't, then your hand would go right through the wall. So that's how that has to be done. So this is now a free body diagram done completely right. All the forces are there, and the forces that weren't on the axes, we had to take components of. All right, that's my it for my examples of free body diagrams. You will do a bunch more of these when you do the Mastering Physics for Chapter 5.